Hello everyone and welcome to another video here on Questrified. My name is Serafina and today we're going to be looking at the RMS Titanic. So let's get right into it. The reason that the Titanic is a personal interest of mine is because there is so much information to consume and hindsight is 2020. When learning about the grand ship, I like to think that I'm learning about innovation of the early 1900s. There is so much history to behold that surrounds the White Star Line, their storied history, and the fate of all the ships they had commissioned. I would like to think that everyone who boarded the Titanic on that April day was quite impressed by the size, details, and accommodations. There must have been such a hope for the future in that moment. No one knew what was ahead of them. They only knew what they were leaving behind. No one knew that the great unsinkable ship would founder and fail them. Many of the passengers did not even plan to be on Titanic, but a coal strike led to other ships giving up their coal to Titanic and with it their passengers. The Ship of Dreams was not perfect in any way. Its design and construction were not the safest and thinking that it was unsinkable was simply a death wish. This very thinking gave people a false sense of security and caused the eventual evacuation to fail and a great loss of life to be had. Lifeboats leaving with very few souls on board was a failure of the crew and White Star Line's advertising was downright dangerous. If J. Bruce Ismay knew to jump into a lifeboat, then it must have dawned on him that the ship was not heading to New York, but rather it was going to the bottom of the North Atlantic. I for one appreciate the story of Titanic, the real story. There are film adaptations of what happened along with conspiracy conspiracy theories about how and why Titanic sank on April 15, 1912. In this video, I will tell you the real story based on all the research I have performed. I will touch on the preventions that could have saved Titanic and actions taken after the disaster to ensure it would never happen again. Just for fun, I will tell you one of the more popular conspiracy theories and then debunk it the best that I can. I do believe that people tend to think that when something so big happens and the loss of life is so great, the expectation is that the cause needs to be just as grand. There must have been some great force that brought down Titanic because human error, coincidence, and poor regulations are just not good enough explanations. I hope you enjoy this video and perhaps you can discern that what you believe about Titanic is either fact or fiction. Allow me to open with a spoiler. On April 14, 1912, the RMS Titanic, traveling across the North Atlantic from Southampton to New York, struck an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. The damage to the ship doomed it and it sank just two hours and 40 minutes after impact. It disappeared beneath the waves at 2.20 a.m. on April 15, 1912, never to see sunlight again. Why did White Star commission such a ship as Titanic? Cunard was the shipping company that owned the ships the Lusitania and the Mauritania. Cunard was cornering the market in the transatlantic travel and was White Star Line's greatest competition. Cunard's ships ferried people from England to America in full luxury and speed. Mauritania's top speed was 26 knots and could make the trip in five days. Bruce Ismay, the director of White Star, had to find some way to compete with Cunard. There was pressure on Ismay to turn a profit. Although White Star was a British company, it was owned by American financier John Pierpoint Morgan, better known as J.P. Morgan. In 1907, the chairman of Harlan and Wolf, Lord Perry, threw a party at his mansion, which was attended by Bruce Ismay. During the party, Lord Perry and Mr. Ismay came up with a plan to build three large ships. Some of the designs were sketched out at that very dinner party. The idea for the fourth fake funnel happened at the party. Ismay named them the Olympic class due to their proposed size. It also resurrected a name that Bruce's father, Thomas, had wanted to use. Olympic. The three ships would be the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Gigantic. You don't remember a ship from White Star called the Gigantic? You're right. It was changed to Britannic. The Britannic was requisitioned during World War I and served as a hospital ship. It was hit by either a floating mine or a German U-boat's torpedo, and it sank in the Aegean Sea off the coast of Greece in 1916. More than 1,000 people were able to get off the ship, while 30 lost their lives. I encourage everyone to research this ship because it too is fascinating. I may cover it at some point on this channel, but the captain chopped people up with a propeller. It's just interesting. Back to the Titanic. Harlan and Wolf was a shipbuilding company in Belfast, Ireland that had an exclusive agreement with White Star. It was so important to this region economically. It employed over 15,000 locals and other businesses were dependent on it as well. Once Perry and Ismay agreed on the plan of building large luxurious ships, it would be J.P. Morgan who bankrolled the construction of them. This means that they would be, along with all the other 
ships owned by White Star, Morgan's assets. When Morgan took over White Star Line, he agreed that in the event of war, any of White Star's ships could be requisitioned as troop carriers. Several of them did see wartime service, including the Olympic. Britannic was requisitioned right off the line and it never accepted a dime for personal passage. Olympic was the first off the line. She had a maiden voyage, which was filled to capacity, but there wasn't that much fanfare. There were no records beaten, as the building of these ships was not to beat the speeds of Cunard's ships. The plan was to be grander in all classes, including third class. If the ships offered more than Cunard's, perhaps White Star could turn a decent profit and pressure could be lifted off Bruce Ismay. Olympic and Titanic, sister ships, were nearly identical. They were the same length, 882 and a half feet, and they were the same width, 92 and a half feet. Each had nine decks, but Titanic weighed more, which made her the largest man-made object in 1912. Her weight was 54,000 tons. I just covered the SS Atlantic, and it was only 3,707 tons. It's amazing how much bigger the ships were getting. Her top speed was 24 knots. She did not reach the speed during her maiden voyage. When it is stated that she was steaming at full speed through the ice field, well, that's just not completely factual. Ismay was not whispering in the captain's ear telling him to go faster. This only means that the captain did not slow down from the speed at which he was going, about 22 knots, when he received the ice warnings. Titanic always seemed to have a certain lore about her. Some say that what happened to her was foreseen due to the 1898 book Futility. This book was authored by Morgan Robertson. In it, he told a story about a large ship called the Titan. Titan sailed in April, struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic, and sank. There were many wealthy people on board, and there were not enough lifeboats, and many lost their lives. The Titan was also referred to as unsinkable. Sounds familiar, does it not? Only 14 years later, Titanic would make the story about the Titan nonfiction. Construction on the Titanic began on March 31, 1909 at the Harlan and Wolf Shipyard in Belfast. Special slips had to be built in order to accommodate the construction. What made White Star Line refer to Titanic as practically unsinkable were two particular features in her construction. The first being a double-bottom hull, and the second being the ship was divided into 16 watertight compartments. If Titanic's full hull had been doubled, or if the bulkheads between the watertight compartments had been higher than just 10 feet above the waterline, perhaps she would have been a bit more practically unsinkable. Have you ever noticed that word practically when referring to the unsinkability of Titanic? When the advertisements for Titanic were released, they stated that the ship was practically unsinkable. People saw this, took it in, and processed it as Titanic is simply unsinkable. A great many forgot the word practically, and for that memory flaw, many lost their lives. When it came time to load the lifeboats, several turned down their spot as they believed Titanic just could not sink and there was no real danger. The fact was, a seat in a lifeboat determined who would live and who would die. In addition to this fact, the crew did not put any urgency in the evacuation of the ship. The hull of Titanic was made of overlapping steel plates, one inch thick, and fastened together by over three million rivets. When people see a part of Titanic, in the museum, they often say that they don't make things like this anymore. They are sometimes being ironic, but sometimes they are speaking while being awestruck. I saw the large piece of Titanic in Las Vegas and I was just amazed. The approximate total construction cost for building Titanic was $7.5 million, which would translate to about $123 million in today's money. Thomas Andrews, the nephew of Lord William James Peary, was the head of Harlan and Wolf's design department, and he oversaw the creation of the ship's plans. I am sure he wanted to please White Star Line and give them a well-designed ship that would be easy for passengers to navigate and enjoy, but the design he came up with made it unsafe in case of an accident. He tried to design a ship around a hotel instead of putting a hotel inside a ship. Lord Perry, the chairman of Harlan and Wolf, controlled Titanic's overall design. General Manager Alexander Carlyle was in charge of the details. At each stage of planning, the plans were sent to Bruce Ismay for his suggestions and for his approval. It seems as if there was just too many cooks in the kitchen. Each of them had different motivations, and different design styles. On May 31, 1911, Titanic was launched. It wasn't yet complete. It was just an empty hull. It would be another 10 months before completion would be accomplished. Nevertheless, the people crowded into Harlan and Wolf shipyard and stood along the banks of the River Lagan to watch the large ship being moved into the water. Lord and Lady Perry, J.P. Morgan, Bruce Ismay, and all their guests watched from a special grandstand. Many at this event did not even realize that a worker, James Dobbins, was injured before the launch when a large wooden post had fallen and pinned his leg under it. His co-workers found him and drug him free. He died the next day. He was one of six men to die while working on Titanic. 
The lifeboat situation is always questioned. Because record keeping was not the best in 1912, the number of how many were on board the ship at the time of the disaster can change from report to report. The number that I subscribe to is 2,207, and of this number, nearly 900 were crew. Titanic was only half full during her maiden voyage, but her lifeboats, if filled to capacity and all launched, would hold 1,178. This means that 1,029 never had a chance. Titanic was in full compliance with the Board of Trade's regulation, which states that any ship over 10,000 tons had to carry at least 16 lifeboats. The Board of Trade did not keep up with ships getting bigger and bigger, so a ship that was 54,000 tons, as Titanic was, only required 16 lifeboats. However, Titanic had a total of 20 lifeboats. There were 14 main lifeboats, 2 emergency sea boats, and 4 collapsible boats. The crew was unfamiliar with this equipment. During the building and designing process of the ship, General Manager Alexander Carlyle originally had 64 lifeboats in his plan. The owners and builders reduced the number to 32, and then reduced them again to 16 which was regulation. It was all about the deck space. The wealthy needed room to roam around the decks. This was a special activity among the open ocean to be able to walk while on the ocean. The four collapsible canvas-sided boats were later added. On September 20, 1911, RMS Olympic, Titanic's older sister, was involved in an accident with the HMS Hawk. Olympic's propellers had drawn the Hawk into her, and the Hawk tore a 40-foot gash in the Olympic's hull, both above and below the waterline. A quick patch job had to be done lest the ship sink. Once somewhat seaworthy, she made her way back to Belfast for extensive repairs. Due to this accident, the workers had to stop working on Titanic to fix Olympic. Titanic's maiden voyage was postponed from March 20th, 1912 to April 10th. This was not good news as the longer a ship isn't moving people and cargo, the longer the owners go without making money. Another bad thing is that ice would have moved into the shipping lanes by April, so there might be more peril for ships crossing the North Atlantic. The Titanic's sea trials and inspection from the Board of Trade were quite brief. They were not considered in the normal range. Olympics trials lasted two days. The trials are done to test the ship's top speed, how fast she can come to a complete stop, and to see how she can turn in a complete circle. The inspection is to make sure that all regulations are met. The owners and builders were satisfied with the sea trials as they figured Titanic would perform the same as Olympic. Titanic's owners did not want to miss the April 10th sailing date. Once the crew was finished with the sea trials, they sailed Titanic to Southampton, the port where the maiden voyage would be Again. Unlike Olympic, people were not allowed aboard Titanic for a tour. The reason for this was because it was not fully finished yet. Carpet was still being installed, painting was still being done, and fixtures were still going up. Hiring the crew of seamen, firemen, and stewards was still being conducted in Southampton. In addition to these things, coal had to be loaded onto the ship. All the food to feed all the people had to be brought aboard, and the cargo that many were shipping needed to be put down in the cargo hold. It was a busy place leading up to the voyage. Captain Edward J. Smith was to be the man to command Titanic on her maiden voyage. He was 62 years old and had been with White Star Line for 38 years, in which 25 of those years was as captain. At the end of Titanic's first voyage, Captain Smith was rumored to be set to retire, but there is no proof of this rumor. He was called the millionaire's captain. He was considered a cheerful man who was well liked by the wealthy passengers who would travel on White Star ships. Some of them would change their tickets and or reservations to sail on his ship. Smith was well paid. He earned $1,250 pounds or $6,250 per year. That is about $175,000 in today's money. He was also eligible for a bonus of 250 pounds or $1,000 if none of his ships he captained had an accident. That would be an additional $28,000 in today's money. This may not have seemed like much, but compare it to the next in command, Chief Officer Henry Wilde. His earnings were 300 pounds or $1,500 per year. This translates into about $42,000 in today's money. It is quite the difference, and it does not include the tips that Captain Smith may have received from his wealthy admirers. Despite the bonus offered, I doubt that Captain Smith collected it, as he had a not-so-good safety record. He had three accidents alone on Olympic. He was the reason that Titanic's maiden voyage was postponed. I don't understand why he was given command of Titanic. This was the ship that Bruce Ismay was hanging all of his hopes on. It doesn't make sense unless Ismay thought that Captain Smith was a draw for the wealthy passengers. That concludes the build or the birth of the Titanic. Next week, we will look at the first and final voyage of Titanic. Thank you so much for joining me. Please take care of yourselves, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!